I'm thankful that you're here this morning. I invite you to get your Bible and turn along with us as we study God's Word together. If you find out anything that we say or do here this morning that you believe is not true, please uh, talk to us about it. Let's sit down and reason from Scripture. We want to be sure that we're following the truth. Have you ever been asked this question? Why are you a member of the Church of Christ? I suppose you have, and it's a fair question, and it's also a question that we need to be prepared to answer. Peter, who answered a lot of questions we see that he was approached with, wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to be ready when people ask us what they need to do to be saved, or they ask us why we're a member of the Church of Christ. We need to be ready to give that answer, that defense, and we need to do so, not belittling people, but we need to answer their questions in meekness and fear. Why the Church of Christ? Let me just say right now, being prepared to give the right answer is what is important. And the right answer is not because my parents were members of the Church of Christ. Or that's all I've ever known. We need to give good biblical answers of this question. And I think the first thing we need to be able to understand is that Jesus Christ is the founder. He's the founder. I should desire to be a member of the one church that he came here to establish. I mean, he only came here to establish one church. Not 5,000, not 3,000, not 300, but one. And we can see that when Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and he mentions seven ones there. He said, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. The very uh, first one, one body. That's talking about the body of Christ. That's talking about the church, his kingdom. He only came to establish one. And the fifth one, and these verses is one faith, one faith. And that reminds me of Jude 3, where we read, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. One faith, once delivered unto the saints. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He proved that Without, beyond a shadow of a doubt by the resurrection from the dead. He is the Son of God and He came to this earth to save us. He lived a perfect life on this earth, sinless life. He served uh, as the only perfect sacrifice for sins for all the world, all the way back from Adam and Eve until now. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 as recorded by Luke, Jesus established his church. Now, sometime before that, he had told his disciple Peter that he was going to establish his church. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, after Peter confessed that he is the Son of God, Jesus said to him, and I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus promised to build his church and build it he did. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the church was established as the gospel began to be preached. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Added to the church. The church was established and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Jesus paid a tremendous price to establish one church. And that's the one that we should be seeking. That's the one that we have to look for. 
He suffered an agonizing death, unlawfully crucified by the very chosen people of God. And by the shedding of his blood on the tree of Calvary, he purchased the opportunity for us to be saved. He established his church. It was the church undivided and complete. There are no man-made denominations of the original. One true church was established on the day of Pentecost. And I believe with all my heart that congregations of faithful followers of this only church that Jesus came to build and establish can be found today. People continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Those that gladly received the word. Remember Jesus when he told Peter that he was going to establish it said the gates of Hades cannot prevail against it. It's still in existence today. 20 centuries later after the death of Jesus we see that congregations can be found all over this world. So, the founder is Jesus Christ. That's important that we get that right. A lot of people have established religions. But what about the name? Well, the name, Church of Christ, is referenced in Scripture. The early church did have a name. We know in Scripture that the early congregations of the Lord's people... The Lord's church are referred to as churches of Christ. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, Paul, toward the end of this letter, he wrote to Roman Christians, says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you, or your translation may say salute you. It's important, I think, that we understand that the church of Christ is not so much a name as it is a designation of ownership. It is the church of Christ. It is His. We are members of His body. We are part of the Lord's church and we consider ourselves Christians. He is the head of the church. Nobody else is. We need not put any man-made name before Christ. The most important name that could be on that sign out front is on there. Christ. He purchased this church. He paid for it with his blood. And we need to carry his name. It belongs to him. So the name is referenced in scripture. Also, the Bible is regarded as the sole source of authority and instruction. Why do we use the Bible as our only means of authority for what we practice, how we worship, how we conduct our lives? The answer very simply is, it is the Word of God. God has revealed it to us. Ear has not heard anything like it. Eye has not seen anything like it. It's God revealing His will to us. And how can it be right to accept part of the Bible and disregard the rest? When we're guilty of doing that, we're going down the wrong road and anything in the name of religion is possible. In, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. If we don't have authority for it, we better not do it. If we are told to do it, we have the authority that's been established, we better be doing it. We better be doing it exactly like God has told us. Word or deed, all that we do, do in the name, and that means by the authority of the Lord Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, who was a preacher in Ephesus, reminds Timothy and reminds us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for it. We don't need anything else. It thoroughly equips us for every good work. It completes us. It is useful for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof and correction. It will keep us on the right path. 
It will instruct us in the way of righteousness. It is all that we need. We, we better not have anything else. We are warned at the end of Scripture, don't add to it. Don't take away from it. If we do, we are to suffer the consequences. We're to take it as it is. We are to put it all together and to realize the truth. We're to draw the conclusion that Scripture tells us. And whenever we sit down with people that ask us a question like, why are you a member of the Church of Christ? We need to have our Bible with us. And we need to open it up and show them the Scriptures are useful for directing us in the path that will lead to eternal life. They're words that we need to live by. The Bible contains the truth of God's word. It's the sole source of instruction and authority for all that we do. I remember early on, I was in school, and I was studying with someone, and I had my Bible. I brought it to school that day, and the person I was studying with didn't have a Bible, but they went and got an encyclopedia off the shelf to show me that Peter was the first pope. You don't read that in scripture, but you might can read it in an encyclopedia. And you can read just about anything that you can imagine that man wrote. But we need to be concerned about what God wrote. And the writers of scripture were inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration there in 2 Timothy 3.16. We need to believe that. We need to realize that the word of God is what is to direct our steps. So why the church of Christ? Because the founder is no other than Jesus Christ. It's not some person. It's Jesus Christ. The name is referenced in Scripture. You've got to have a scripture, scriptural name, not a man-made name, if you're going to be the Lord's church. And it's a designation, really, of His ownership. It belongs to Jesus. And the Bible is our sole guide. It's the exclusive source by which we get our authority and teaching and instruction in the Word of God. So I've got another question for you. I want you to consider this. Can we be sure that we are automatically on the right path to eternal life simply because we attend services and have our name in the directory of a congregation that is designated as the Church of Christ? And the answer is, get this, no. No. Why? Because each congregation is responsible for teaching and adhering to the truth. And individually, we are ultimately responsible for our own salvation. It is your responsibility as a Christian to know the truth. You have to test everything I say or anybody else. You have to look. You need to open up Scripture and to search it. Finding out what the truth is. Because ultimately it is up to you. And Paul writing to the church at Philippi said in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, he said, As you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul has been talking about having the mind of Christ and how Christ, the perfect example, has humbled himself and came and saved us and that one day, at the end of time, that judgment day, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess Jesus. And he's saying that do now, do it now and realize that the importance of obedience, Paul has never said that obedience is not important, that you can be saved whatever you do. He stresses obedience, not only when he's with them, but much more when he's not. He says, you... Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, when we stand before God in judgment, we're not going to all be gathered that are here this morning together, and we either all go to heaven or we don't. It's individual. You're responsible. So, you need to be seeking God and the truth in His Word and be sure that you are adhering to that. It's your responsibility. And I'm going to use the King James Version again here. 2 Timothy 2.15 because I like the way that it's translated. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth.
Study God's word. Some translations render that diligence, and we need to study diligently to gain God's approval. You can see at the end of Hebrews chapter 5, those people, by the time they ought to be teachers, they were still having to be taught. They should have the answers, why are you a member of the Lord's body? But they're still having to be taught. They don't know the first principles. They're having to be taught those things over and over again. To please God, we've got to study, we, to be approved of Him. You know, those that you love, and there's nobody that loves you more than God loves you, you should want to please, you should want their approval. If you want God's approval, you'll never get it if you don't know what His Word teaches. Know God's Word, Paul says here, in order to be unashamed. If you have been a Christian, if you've been a member of the Lord's body for years and you don't know what the Bible teaches, you should be ashamed of yourself. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Know the gospel, teach it, don't be ashamed of it. Be ashamed if you don't know it. Be ashamed if you can't teach it. Be ashamed if you can't give someone a good answer when they ask you the reason of the hope that is in you. Be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Not too long ago, we had a lesson about the three ages in Scripture. And I just want to remind you what we see. We see that the, uh, there is the, first of all, and Genesis covers this, the patriarchal age. And God made his will known to the patriarchs, the heads of households. And then there was the Mosaic age. You had Moses and the prophets, and that's the way God revealed his word to the people was through Moses and the prophets, and the law of Moses. When Jesus died on the cross, he established a new covenant. And today we are to listen to him. And in Hebrews chapter 1, the first four verses... He is the one that we're to listen to. Do you remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17? Who did Peter, James, and John see right before their eyes? Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Moses, you've had, he wrote the law, you had the prophets telling them, my will Jesus now is the one that you need to listen to. In fact, a voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I well please. Hear ye Him. We need to listen to Jesus Christ. We are New Testament Christians. So where do we get our pattern for the church today? It's the New Testament. Even in Jeremiah chapter 31, it prophesied of a new covenant that was coming. And we see that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we see, when he left this earth, he gave his disciples a great commission. And he armed them with spiritual gifts as the scriptures were being written. And when the scripture was complete, those temporary gifts were done away with. Miracles, signs, wonders, done away with because we have the powerful word of God, and we need to follow the New Testament pattern for worship. When you walk into an assembly, this is what you need to see, because this is what is in Scripture. Preaching is authorized. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we see that Paul was preaching in Troas, I believe, and he preached until midnight, so Harley, you're preaching tonight. I look forward to hearing you. You have the authority to preach till midnight if you want to, buddy. I'll stay here with you. Preaching is to be done. Praying, we see. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, the church was praying for Peter and John. Giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2. We're told to do that. That's a part of our worship on the first day of the week. That's today. It's the Lord's day. Singing. We've been doing that this morning. Ephesians 5, verse 19. Appreciate the job that our song leaders do here. We need to really think about those words. But we're not commanded. We're not given authority to play any instrumental music. 
And you say, well, what about in the Old Testament? Hey, we're New Testament Christians. We look to the New Testament for authority. It says in Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 to sing. Make your melody in your heart to the Lord. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And when we do that, we're teaching one another. So that's another way of teaching. And then the Lord's Supper, it's so important. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, Paul writes to the church of Corinth and they were not doing it appropriately. They were making a common meal. I tell you, it is not a common meal. It is emphasized, the spiritual part of this, that we think about and Jesus Christ himself established it before he was crucified. The body represents his blood. I mean, the, the, body, the bread represents his body. The, the cup, the contents of that represents his blood that was shed. And Paul says to this church in Corinth, you need to do it right. You need to remember that. Remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Remember that. And you need to examine yourself. Our hearts should be broken when we think about this, when we commune together and partake of the Lord's Supper. But this is what we see the church that was established in, in the New Testament doing, preaching, praying, giving, singing the Lord's Supper. We have authority to do these things and not to bring in our own inventions or not to leave any of these things out, but to keep them the way that God has told us. And Jesus, you remember the conversation that he had with the woman at the well in John chapter 4 verse 24 said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I want you to think about Jesus' statement there. Worship is what we're talking about in spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying that our worship must be from the heart and by the book. If we leave out either of those, we're in trouble. We can be following the letter of the law. We can be doing these things that we have authority to do just like we've talked about. If our heart is not engaged, it will not be acceptable to God. It will not go up as a sweet-smelling aroma. If we leave out the truth, but our heart is in it, we're just full of emotions, we don't really know what Scripture says... We just worship God the way that we want to, the way that we see fit, not the way that he has instructed us. I don't care how much from the heart, how sincere you are, it will never be pleasing to God. So these things have to be together. Both of these elements have to be here. If we're going to be pleasing to God, it must be from the heart and by the book. There's going to be a lot of people at the end of time that think that they've been a part of the right church, religious group, talk about Jesus and call him Lord and say that we've done all these things. But think about what Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23 tell us. Jesus here toward the end of his great Sermon on the Mount says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? They're saying we've done these things by your authority in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He has just said the road to hell is broad, and many are on that road. The road to heaven, eternal life, is narrow. There's not a lot of traffic on that road. But we need to be sure that we are on that road. And that means that we are not practicing lawlessness. I hope no one here on judgment hears these words, I never knew you. Depart from me. I hope you don't hear that. I hope you hear what Jesus said when he talked about the parable of the money or talents. In Matthew chapter 25 to when the master returned and, and the ones that were given talents had to take account for what they had done. We see the one that had been given five talents doubled that. The one that had been given two doubled that. And the master said to these, well done, 
good and faithful servant, you who were faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what I hope we all hear. I hope we hear those words. No better words, no greater compliment could be given than to hear God himself say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You survived all this trouble in your life, all this discouragement. You went through the pandemic. You had a lot of heartache in this life. You didn't have a lot of encouragement, but you stayed faithful. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. Your suffering is over. God will wipe away your tears. No more pain. No more suffering. No more sorrow. Our bodies in this life are not meant to last forever. Even young Dawson, who's in good shape, can get hurt in a football game, can't you, Dawson? It can happen. Eric went through announcements. A sick list. There's always seems to be a sick list, doesn't there, here? People die. We see funerals going on all the time. I pulled over the other day for a funeral procession going through town. And you think about one day, it'll be mine. Am I ready? Am I going to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. That means everything. Somebody asks you why you're a member of the Church of Christ. You say the founder is none other than Jesus Christ. You give them scripture. You show them that it's not a man-made institution. That God established it on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He is the founder. And it wears his name because he owns it. It doesn't belong to us. We can't just do whatever we want with a collection. We've got to do what he said because it's his church. It's his church. We do things his way. It belongs to him. You know, it, it, people can wear that name. And they can have a name like they're alive, but they can be dead because we see that in the letter that Jesus wrote to the churches. Uh, one of those churches, I think it's Sardis, the dead church. They had a name like they were alive. But Jesus' evaluation, and that's the one that matters, he says, you're dead. You're dead. Jesus Christ, it belongs to him. It's his church. He's the founder. And also the Bible has to be the only source of authority and instruction that we use. Harley, I expect you to use book, chapter, and verse tonight. That's what I expect everyone who gets up here to teach, to use book, chapter, and verse. And I love it when I hear a lot of scripture. There's a lot of things being said from pulpits today. The Bible not even being opened. That's a shame. Right here are the words of eternal life. The Bible is the mind of God. It's the way of salvation. It's the comfort of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are accurate. Its decisions are immutable. We need to read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. That's why I'm a member of the Church of Christ. And I don't apologize for it. Let's be unashamed. Let's know what the will of God is and do it. So what about God's plan of salvation? You hear all kinds of things. Some say you don't need to do anything. Some say faith only. Some say that you can save yourselves if you're good enough. The Word of God says, and that's the same thing that was said. Peter was asked a question. He he tells us later to be ready to give an answer. He was ready to give an answer on the day of Pentecost when those that were cut to the heart at the preaching and they realized that they crucified Jesus said, we know we're lost. What do we need to do about it? So in essence, they're asking Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do I need to do to be saved from eternal damnation? And Peter's response was, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those that gladly received the word were baptized that day, and the Lord added them to the church. Don't you want to be saved from sin? Don't, want, don't you want to hear one day, and be faithful unto death, and to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't get better than that. Come if you need to while together we stand and sing.